Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Past guests include Kevin King, Stephen Pope, and Roland Frazier. Today, I'm speaking with Chris Gramlich, a seller and host of the two Amazon sellers and a microphone podcast. And we will be talking a lot about launching new products, the strategies that are working right now, and things you could be implementing in your own business. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting, where I help seven figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. Listen, Chris, I started Hadley Designs back in 2015, and I grew it to an eight figure brand in seven years but I made a lot of mistakes along the way that made the path to getting to eight figures take a little bit longer. Uh, there are times that I had a lot of self-doubt. Could I actually grow a real business? Could I be a, a leader? Could I hire a team? Uh, a lot of those mental you know, challenges that I ran into, and I wish I would have had a mentor along the way to help me overcome some of those obstacles that I encountered and the mistakes that I made that would have allowed me to go faster. If you've hit similar plateaus and you want to know the next steps to take your business to the next level, then go to ecombreakthrough.com. That's ecom with two M's to learn more. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit session at no cost. All you need to do to enter to win this strategy audit is to send me an email at josh at ecombreakthrough.com and in the subject line, say strategy audit and tell me why I should choose your business for this free strategy audit that we'll be giving out. And if you don't win this month, don't worry, you'll be entered for future months to come. Uh, before introducing today's guest, I do want to give a big thank you to Tyler Gregg of Amped. And I want to thank him for referring Chris as a guest for the podcast today. Amped is the leader in bringing Google ad shoppers to Amazon, opening the door to increased revenue higher brand and product rankings, and reduced ad costs. And so today I am excited to introduce you to Chris Gramlich. Chris is a professional FBA seller, a podcast host, and an account executive at Solozo. Chris has always been entrepreneurial and enjoyed the thrill of selling items. From selling items at garage sales as a kid to mowing yards and then selling clothes on eBay, Chris learned how to sell physical products on Amazon in 2013. Starting out by selling things around the house, he learned the basics of retail arbitrage and started sourcing his own products. Chris launched his first product in 2014 after watching YouTube videos and listening to podcasts. Currently, Chris has four brands and enjoys helping other sellers on Amazon. Chris hosts a podcast with Dustin, another seller, where they talk about industry leaders and other sellers. So welcome to the podcast today, Chris. That's quite the intro there, Josh. That was pretty good. I, I'm going to have to take a couple of notes there and kind of implement <laughs> those on our own podcast. That was really good. Hey, well, you, you have a, you have a good bio yourself. I think that's, that's why it sounds so good to you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got that nice and smooth uh, radio voice. I like it. I like it. Well, Chris, welcome to the podcast. We're super excited to have you on. You know, you're doing a lot of cool things in the industry. I think that, uh, you know, you're an account executive at Solozo. You're also hosting another podcast where you're talking to other cool sellers and the strategies that they're implementing in their own business. And then last but not least, you're an actual seller yourself with four brands. So you're in the trenches. You know what's actually going on. You're not one of the, uh, let's call it a fake guru that doesn't actually sell but loves to preach what best practices should be. So, Chris, tell us a little bit more about, you know, uh, Solozo and you being an account executive there, just so people get an idea of, you know, what does that mean? What, what is Solozo? Yeah, for sure. Well, I just happened to fall into Solozo. I went to a local meetup. This is back in like early 2018. Uh, I went to a local meetup here and I'm located in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, it was hosted 
by Salozo. Salozo put it on, and I have never heard of Salozo ever. And I didn't even realize they were in my backyard here. So I uh, went to the meetup, um, you know, met a couple of people that were worked at or still work at the company, talked to other sellers, and it was kind of cool because we, at this meetup, uh, they were going around like, tell us how you're doing, you know, tell us what your business is like. And, uh, you know, back at the time, you know, I'm 2014, so I'm four years in already by the time I get to this meetup. And uh, like m- myself and maybe one other seller were having success on Amazon. A lot of other people were just getting started or just looking for products or they just listed their product and they're trying to struggle with, you know, launching their product. So at the end of it, it was I had a whole crew around me, uh, people talking with me and asking me questions and like, what should I do here? Should I do this? I'm like, you can probably do that. There's just, it was a lot of uh, like stimulation overload. Like I was, I came into this uh, meeting just trying to be like, uh, you know, sit back and kind of hang out and just listen. And it turned into like sharing all the secrets and things that I've done and things that I've seen and things that I would suggest doing. Uh, so it was really cool. So, at the time, I was not with Salozo. I went back to my original job where I've been in the e-com space for a while. Um, so I used to work at an e-commerce company that sold physical products on their own website. Like 85% of their sales were on their own website. So I got to see what it was like to you know, have a warehouse, use inventory, uh, do the marketing, imaging, videos, and like see how to grow a website, uh, for, like drive traffic to it and stuff. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, So I went back to that position and I don't know what happened, but the stars aligned and uh, they let me go shortly thereafter that my position was going to be more automated. I was a buyer at the, at this old company. So a lot of the buying has been since, you know, automated now. Um, So let me go. And I quickly called Salozo and said, Hey, uh, I'd love to come join your Salozo team. I'm a seller. I can uh, relate to sellers. I can help sellers. Like I know PPC, I think I'd be a huge asset and that's how I got in. I got in, start talking to sellers and it's been great. It's been great. So that's how I got in. Solozo is a PPC software. Uh, so what we do is we help sellers with automating their bids, automating the transfer of keywords from one campaign to the next day, parting their campaigns. That's a big term now. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of different terms flying around, but and there's a lot of different tools out there. Uh, Solozo has been around since 2017 uh, it was built by uh, somebody who was, has Google background. So there's a little bit of that built into it. But yeah. So my days consist of helping sellers uh, with their PPC and helping them with their own businesses and kind of like a mentor. You mentioned it in the, in the intro there, like not having a mentor. And we started yeah. around the same amount of time. There was really nothing out there. Uh, a couple of podcasts, maybe a couple of YouTube channels, but there really was no like meetups and, and yeah. whatnot. So uh, I like to give back as much as I can. No, I, I love that, Chris. Yeah, I think both you and I, like it was so new, you know, when, when we both kind of got onto Amazon, even though people started even earlier than that. Um, yeah. But it's definitely evolved over the years. And I think having a mentor that's kind of been there, done that to help you, uh, I, I feel like is so invaluable. And I mean, you get to do that on a day-to-day basis. So you're looking under the hood of multiple businesses, you have your own brands, you know, as you, what are some of the biggest challenges that you are seeing other sellers facing on Amazon right now? Not only, maybe it's some of your own brands, maybe it's some of the existing, you know, clients that you're working with. Yeah. Good question. Well, CPCs are rising. So cost per clicks are going through the roof. Uh, you really got to figure out what terms you want to go after, what keywords you want to go after when you're know, doing bidding on, on your ads. But I'd say that the main thing is, and this is something I do whenever somebody you know books a call and we talk with somebody, is just look at their listings. Like, let's see, show me your storefront. Like, let's see the listings. Because with, you know, with a bad listing, with no imaging or small imaging or not optimized images, a bad title, short bullets, even like the EBC and no videos, like that stuff is necessary now. Um, you know, when people come to your listing, you want them to convert. And if you lack that stuff and or even reviews, if you lack all that other, you know, optimization things with title bullets, imaging, um, it's going to, your conversion rate's going to go down. So the first thing we, that I like to do, it, it, especially when somebody books a call is just learn their business. Like I pull up their products, we see what they're doing. 
And a lot of the things I'm seeing right now is just like listing optimization. Um, you know, interesting. I think imaging or images is probably the number, number one thing that I would focus on. Uh, a lot of sellers, a lot of people I talk to, are like, I just had these built on Canva real quick, or I just hired a Fiverr gig. I, I put the money in your images. You know, uh, definitely spend the money in your images because when when people come to your listing, they're going to scroll through your images and make that decision on whether or not they're going to buy. That that would be the thing I'm seeing currently with with most accounts, uh, people that are coming on trying to use Solozo and, and and they're just images are kind of lackluster. Yeah. So tell me more about that. Like, what are the mistakes that people are making with their images that you're like, dude, come on, well, you, yeah. you got to step up your game here. Yeah. Uh, poor Photoshop. Like it's just, you can see right through it. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I see like images in the, in the Photoshop, just does not look right. Or somebody's holding like a makeup brush and you can obviously tell that it's not the same. Like it doesn't match up correctly. It's just bad Photoshopping. So that, that just a big turnoff personally for me, just, it doesn't feel uh, like a, uh, like a good brand or it gives like, it makes me feel like something else is wrong with the product. If they didn't spend the time to, do like real lifestyle photos and, and give it like a, a good feel, like a premium feel. So bad imaging or, or bad Photoshop. Another one is just not enough. Uh, you know, they just throw a couple images in there, three or four images. And, and I was guilty of this at the very beginning too, just trying to get my feet wet and, and learn this throughout the, you know, the time of selling on Amazon, but just, you know, three or four images and they think that's enough. Uh, another one is the, the font. So, uh, you know, infographics are great. Uh, but if they, if they're not zoomable, no one can read what's going on here. Especially if you have a product that has a lot of moving parts or needs instructions, uh, your font, it has to be something can read. So zoomable images, that's something to look at. And, and I, I like to give this tip out, uh, to anybody, like whenever I talk to somebody, just go look it up on mobile, like go type what your main keyword you want to look at on mobile inside the app and just see what the photos look like there. And just kind of get an idea, like what you should be doing. You know, there's things you can do to like make the photo taller, so it takes up a little bit more room on the search results, or uh, make it you know bigger so that they can see what you're actually selling without having to click on it. So if you do run pay per click, uh, you kind of cut your wasted ad spend out because people aren't like researching it; they already know not to click on that one because maybe it's not exactly what they're looking for. So you kind of save some money there. So. Just, I think imaging gets overlooked. Um, I, I would spend the money to you know, make sure that you have the correct images. And then the flow of images, I'll, I'll end on this one, like the flow of your images. Like tell the story of your images. You know, you got the main image first. Uh, tell me a little bit about it second. Show me some lifestyle photos, the benefits of it, and then maybe have a video at the end of it to kind of, you know, tie it all together. Uh, that would be one quick suggestion. Awesome. I love that. I, I completely agree with you. And I think that's one of the most interesting, interesting things. You know, you're working with a lot of clients in PPC, right? But your very first thing, like in terms of mistakes people making, it wasn't, oh, they're advertising on wrong keywords or their campaigns are set up in the wrong place or whatever. Like your first thing is like, no, I look at their images and typically that's where they're going wrong. And I, I would uh, completely agree with you here in the aspect of a lot of sellers, to be honest with you, aren't spending the amount of time and thought that they should with those listing images. And like you mentioned, like it makes all the difference. It's funny, like within our own niche and we have different competitors that we follow and I'm amazed that they get any sales because some of their products, like when they Photoshop it, it's like this poster or whatever is like two times the size of a child. Like that's not what this product is like. How in the world? Like, I don't even know how that passed the sniff test. Like somebody was like, that looks good, right? Like, but I, I think that if you just outsource it to somebody and you're like, oh, well, they're the Photoshop expert. I'm just going to load it up. Like, I think that's a big miss. Um, and so I uh, completely agree with you, like doubling down on the images. And we've talked about this in previous episodes, but that main image is everything. And especially when it relates to PPC and you want to increase your click through rate, you want to stand out on Amazon and especially on mobile. I like that you touched on mobile because I think everybody's working on their desktop, right? And it's like, oh, this looks great on desktop. 
most consumers, I think it's over 66% for sure now. Oh, yeah, are, at least. Are on mobile, right? And so they're on the app. So go on the app, go on the mobile site, and see what it looks like when you're scrolling down. And then if you notice, like, everybody looks the same, well, good. Here's your opportunity to do something different, right? Either zoom in on the image or you could test out adding, like, different items to the product or, you know, calling out different features in that main image. I think one of the biggest takeaways I've had recently from many sellers that I've spoken to is that you can kind of push the boundaries a little bit more on those main images than I think people initially have been doing. And worst case scenario, Amazon just, you know, kind of suppresses that image or that listing for a little bit. It's not like you're getting a mark on your account per se, right? That's like, oh, yeah, and you'll know quick. Suspended. You'll know quick if it's something they don't like. Like if the background's not fully white, you'll be able to upload a photo and before you even probably hit save, it'll give you like an invalid, like this photo is not going to work, change your main image type of deal. So you'll know pretty quick, but I do like that you mentioned you can, you can uh, push the envelope a little bit with your, with your photos for sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you have to, right. Especially with, with PPC. So, and then optimizing for mobile. So I love that. That's a great way to start out. I think you shared a lot of value already. Um, so what else? So you've looked at images, right? And you're looking yeah. at listings, trying to optimize them. What else are you seeing kind of mistakes, easy mistakes that sellers are making that, you know, people should be aware of? Yeah, you, you touched on a little bit there. And it's like the structure, the structure of your campaigns. Uh, everybody goes after exact match, not enough, rec not enough like data to try a phrase or, uh, or broad match. Uh, they have maybe all their keywords uh, in one campaign, uh, I like to split that out. So our personal preference is, you know, broad goes to broad, phrase is phrase, and exact is exact. And just keep those keywords separate um, and, and kind of make sure the bids are, you're optimizing the bids on each one just to kind of get an idea of what's working and what's not working. Uh, so I like to, you know, the structure is something that I really like harp on. Uh, so after we look at images, we then uh, look at their structure and see what they're doing. Uh, it, it's all over the map. Some people have, you know, just a, a simple auto campaign. That's all they're doing is just auto campaigns. That's like, okay, we're going to change your life here. We're going to do something yeah. different than just auto campaigns. <laughs> we're going to try some, you know, broad phrase exact. We're going to get you discovered more. Uh, but some other people have really extensive like structures they've already built. The big sell big sellers, especially um, that we see a lot of that come over to Solozo. We have a tool called Campaign Studio, and Campaign Studio actually allows you, like, it's a visual. Uh, I don't know if you've ever remembered, and this is going back a little bit, so you probably will, uh, the tool mini chat where you actually oh, yeah. would, yep. would make like flows, like sequences. Yep. Like, flows. It's the same visual, but with your with your Amazon campaign. So if you think That's about cool. how your mini chat was set up where you were dragging and dropping from one place to the next, we're doing the same thing with like an auto campaign goes to your broad campaign. And what's going to end up happening there is when your auto campaign converts, it takes that search term and moves it to whatever broad campaign or phrase exactly to be able to set up. So when sellers come to us with a really, really large uh, structure they've already got set up, that campaign studio is like, it takes whatever they were envisioning in their head and it shows them on the screen and they love it. So uh, the structure is super important. Uh, I see a lot of uh, testing with uh, top of search recently. Uh, you know, we're, we're in Q4, holidays coming up, uh, ranking for keywords. I would probably start doing that now. Uh, so that, you know, about time, you know, three weeks from now, by the time uh, holiday shopping starts, you're ranked organically well already. Uh, don't wait now. I would do it right now. So we're seeing a lot of top of search, like top five keywords, uh, top of search multiplier, really high. Give me aggressive bids so that by the time, you know, holiday season comes, they're ranked organically well to start. So um, a lot of that is happening right now. Uh, a lot of top of search is happening right now. And then another one is just to kind of end up here on that is sponsor display. I used to hate sponsor display. I kind of mm. still do, but uh, it, it's, it's something that I think a lot of people are leaving money behind, especially if your product is something that people rebuy again and like you can retarget them, not only on Amazon, but off Amazon. And I think Amazon is coming up with some more features. They just announced recently that sponsor display is going to have video ads in, uh, added to it. Right. Uh, so that's going to be huge. So I, I think sponsored display needs a little bit more attention. 
And, and we're starting to see that inside the app here, inside Solozo, that a lot of people are starting to do that, especially for products where they can retarget customers. Awesome. I love that. I think there's there's a lot of golden nuggets there, and, and we can dive into some of these rabbit holes. Um, but where I kind of want to take this conversation <laughs> is, you know, we could spend all day in, in PPC land. Uh, I think everybody knows that. Yeah. But let's go to, let's see what's working best for sellers when they're launching products. So you have your sure. own brands. You have four different brands. I'm sure that as you work with clients and even as you have on your podcast, you've probably heard some really cool strategies in terms of ways that people are launching products. So tell me from your perspective, what do you see working when it comes to launching products on Amazon now? Well, it's the tried and true method. I think that more people are paying attention to, and it's, it's building an audience, building a list, getting like your funnel set up and having your passionate customers ready so that when you launch a new product, all you got to do is hit up your list, whether it be through uh, messenger or whether it be through email or whatever, whatever device you're using. Uh, so that when you hit, when you launch a new product, you hit that list up and they're ready to roll and you start to get that sales velocity. So I think the, the strategy that in person, what I'm using is just list building. Uh, you know, and that starts with a, a really, really nice insert card. Now, some of this may be a little bit gray area and, and, you know, do what you wish, read the TOS. Uh, but anytime you buy something off Amazon, normally you're getting an insert card anyway. So, yeah. um, you know, just do what you want, but, uh, insert cards are, are, you know, being more and more advanced, I'll say, uh, you know, driving people to a landing page where they can, uh, register or extend a warranty, or they can learn more about your brand, um, getting them more involved with your community, sharing, sharing your social, uh, tags or your social handles. Uh, people like to see that. So to launch a product, to answer your question, launch a product, I have my list built out and I'm seeing people do this, uh, especially using Solozo. Uh, they have their list built out. Um, they get that momentum built up. And as soon as it hits the inventory, uh, as soon as Amazon gets the inventory, uh, PPC, it, their start dates are turned on. Uh, their list is buying and they get that momentum going. And, and then there's things you can do to the listing, obviously, to help with that conversion rate. But to launch a product... Uh, it used to be easy, Josh. Remember the back in the day, like ninety nine percent off coupons. And oh like yeah, yeah. Free like that. That was crazy. That was that was crazy. Uh, and I'm glad Amazon got rid of that because it really cleaned it up. But you know, I now agree. I think it's building a list and being more brand. Uh, like build a brand, right? Like don't just sell random products. Like be a brand, create a list, and hit that list up when you have new products. Yeah. No, I I completely agree. When we had Kevin King on uh, the podcast he had talked a lot about you know that's well, that's what he sees being the biggest differentiating factor over the next five to ten years is like it's only going to get more challenging unless you lean into like creating a real brand and having a brand voice and then gaining your own audience like you're going to be left to the wayside um, if you don't keep up so i want to dive in a little bit more with um, how you're building that audience with insert cards you know we do the yeah. same thing with our brand, I don't know that I necessarily see that as like overly gray. I mean, you look at like a box that, you know, grab some Clorox wipes, right? What's on the product label for Clorox wipes? Uh, it's the PNG website, right? So like, and they have like a, you know, they, they're not saying like, hey, come register your warranty per se, but like they have links to their social media, right? They have their icons, they have their website on there. So like, I don't think people need to be as scared about that, right? But what are you seeing working really well when it comes to product inserts? Well, uh, if anything good out of COVID came, it's that people were more adapted to QR codes. <laughs> yeah, so agreed. <laughs> people like start to, they know what that is now. And so a QR code, like that just now people realize, oh, I can scan that. So a QR code insert um, that, is has some type of messaging messaging like the thank you um you know get your free gift uh there's there's things that that i'm doing now where uh somebody scans it uh they go to a landing page uh in that landing page they give name email address um order id number uh and and that just kind of verifies that the order matches with amazon order so we're not just getting spammed for free gift Yep. Uh, 
and, and they scan it and, and we just give a free gift out. And uh, all they got to do is provide us with their name and their email address. Uh, we're thinking about adding uh, their mailing address there uh, just to kind of have that for like a backup plan to do postcards. Uh, I get a, a random side note here, but I bought something on Amazon, like literally 60 days later, I got a gift, you know, like a postcard in the mail. Really? How this, how this guy know to send me this postcard for another item. So like reverse engineering, that's kind of fun for me. So I'm trying to figure that out. But um, yeah, the insert scan QR code landing page, basic information, you know, first name, last name, email address, and then the order ID. Uh, we're using a tool called um, it's, it's going away from me. Zapier or Zapier, however you want to pronounce okay. it. That, yep. that, that uh, links up order IDs so that uh, when they type an order ID, it matches correctly with the order ID inside your account. Um, and then from there, we send them a free sample and the free sample, you know, it's just something to like get them to engage with us, maybe try another product that we're thinking about launching down the road. Um, it also just allows them to like feel a warm and fuzzy. So maybe that when that review request does come and, and that, that review request is done by Amazon, we're not sending any more like, Hey, give us a five-star review. We're just leaving it more like, providing value and whenever they get something from Amazon that says, how would you rate your experience with so-and-so brand? Maybe they think, Hey, that was a good brand. I'll leave a five-star review. So we're leaving yeah, that alone. So you're not even touching reviews. No, you're not even want to touch it. Yep. Yeah. Just you know, leave it alone, like just value. Yep. I, I agree a hundred percent with the, you know, not even touching reviews. We we've made the same decision because we have opt-in flows and all of that. And, Everybody's like, why don't you ask for a review? And it's like, I'm not even touching it with a 10 foot pole. Because not anymore, that's, man. <laughs> that's the one thing that like is if Amazon's going to suspend you overnight for something, it's going to be review manipulation. It's like that is something you don't even want to cross. And, and I think they're not even like suspending people. I think they're just like shadow banning like your products now. And it's like not even going to touch it. Like, yeah, it's, it's not, not worth it's it. Not worth it. Yeah, it's not worth it. And plus, I think there's enough going on in the background that, it, that Amazon does with reviews and whatnot. And the people that buy off, like we're all Amazon shoppers. We kind of get the idea that you can leave reviews and we get those emails. And so I rather just leave that alone, get a free sample, give me your email address. And when we launch a new product, we'll let you know, and we'll give you a discount code and you can go buy the new product. So I don't even, I'm with you. I don't, I don't touch the reviews. Let's let, let that be. Yeah. Hey, going back to, so I, I like the idea of using QR codes and it goes to a landing page. Um, number one question would be like, what type of free, you know, gifts are you giving to people when they do opt in? And then secondly would be, you know, what, what messaging do you have on that insert card that kind of draws people in to say, yeah, I do want this free gift. Or is it just kind of a mysterious free gift that they're after? Right. And yeah. I'm curious, like what your conversion rates are. Uh, in terms of like people actually scanning it. So the free gift, luckily for me, um, or not, I would say when I did, when I've been doing Amazon, I switched all my uh, thought process from sourcing from China and overseas to sourcing here in the States. So all my products are here locally so I can get product really quickly. That's awesome. Uh, one, one cool thing is that uh, I, I talked to my supplier and I said, look, we're going to try something here where I'm just going to, we're going to do a free gift and it's just going to be a smaller version uh, or a smaller quantity of what we're going to sell in the long run. But I just want to get people to touch it like a sample pack of it. Mm. And they're like, no problem. So that that's, it, you know, maybe cost me like four or five bucks cost my cost to do that. And I am paying okay. a little bit of shipping here, obviously, but it's worth it when you get the email address, especially if you're going to launch your products. So the, the gift is a product that they're probably going to use again or they're probably going to buy again, or they're going to have interest in again, you know, come 90 days or 120 days when we fully go live with it. The messaging on the insert card is simple. It's, you know, thank you. Here's your free gift and the steps of how to claim it. It just says scan for free, scan QR code for free gift, put your information in, confirm your email address really is all it says. And so, okay. and we, and we kind of make it, you know, uh, brand centric, like tell our kind of our story, like how we started this and why we started this brand. When I say we, uh, I'm talking about my wife and I, uh, and, and why we started it. And so that kind of, you know, gets them in there like, Oh, this is a, like a small family business, hopefully yep. like, 
that gets them to commit. They scan it. And, and when they get to the page, I put a video in there. So the video on the landing page is like, it's me again. Like, Hey, you know, thanks for taking the time to scan the QR code uh, to get your free gift. Simply just fill out the form below, confirm your email address, and we will get a free gift sent your way. So, uh, and cool. a lot of people reply to those, like they, I get personal emails back. So it, it's kind of nice. Dude, yeah, dude, that that's awesome. So on the landing page, do you ever reference like what free gift they're that they're getting, or is it just completely random and they're just like, "All right, it's let's random. see what you're going to send me." <laughs> yeah, it's, it's random. So uh, cool. the products that they're going to get are going to be in the same niche of the product that they bought. So it's okay. It, it it's all going to be in, in the in the same area. So it it's not like uh, they're going to buy a silicone spatula and then they're going to get a water bottle. Like it's, it's all going to be within the same category, uh, just a smaller version. There's a lot of different variations, which makes it nice for the, for, for the free gift. Um, but the, the opt-in rate, you know, they, all they got to do is just name, email, order ID. The order ID was something we just added, uh, just to kind of prevent the, the spam, uh, yeah. of people just coming to the page. Cause once that gets out there, the page gets shared to all these freebie gifts. And yeah. next thing you know, we're giving away a bunch of freebies. So we we did the order ID to kind of verify that, but yeah, it's super easy, um, super simple. And then we use um, Mailchimp to follow up on emails. Okay. And we don't email a lot. We don't. Need, I don't have like a lot of flows built. Uh, the the emails are like thank you, you know, for joining the VIP club. Um, and then you know maybe like two weeks later, uh, we'll give them an email ton about our story and what, why we created the brand and and what we're doing and kind of like a roadmap of products that we're looking to promote um, and just kind of keep it casual. And then when we got a new product coming out, I'll hit up that email list, you know, maybe a month before, let them know, you know, get ready. It's coming. Uh, I like to share like photos behind the scenes a little bit. Like we're not, we're packing them up or yeah. um, you know, we're, we're getting ready to mail these out. Kind of give my, let them feel like, you know, they're part of it and, and they are. Um, and then when we go live, that's the tricky part. I'm sure you've met, <laughs> had to deal with this too, is like, uh, Amazon will check it in, but it's not really fully checked in. So you got to yeah. kind of like wait for it to be fully checked in. Um, so once it's fully checked in, we send out a blast, um, uh, they purchase, purchase the item. Um, and then we go from there, but we, you know, the ins insert just one part of it. There's other things I like to do outside of the insert just to kind of get the momentum going, um, and, and get those get those sales going. Um, but the insert's just, just part of it. Yeah, no, I love that. And, and I love the strategy that you're employing with kind of giving somebody like a smaller version of a, of a product, um, with that. So you, is this kind of like a consumable or is this, this is something like they're going to like use up over time or yeah, is this it's more like, of a consumable? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So we're in the pet niche. I'm in the pet space. So, okay. Just, just think dog treats. And then now you know, okay, there's a lot of dog treats. Yeah. So there's a lot of options. So, uh, you know, we can go all over the map as far as samples go. Uh, yeah. But it just allows, like, they get it. And if they like it, great. And, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, I don't need, like, my dog doesn't like this. Or we don't give our dog this stuff. It's like, no problem. Uh, we have a whole slew of other products that we can offer you. Yeah. Let us know what you like. And I'll send you another free sample. Like, I rather interesting. I rather send a hundred samples out to one person and hope like it, it, to make them happy than just like not send them anything else. So like, uh, you know, um, one thing I've learned at that e-commerce company I worked at was like, we would send out free items just out of nowhere because people said they lost their item in shipping or, uh, mm. if the item they sold, the item they bought from us a week ago, all of a sudden broke at a game and they needed it. Like, so we just sent them a free item. And so that like that, I had to kind of lower my guard a little bit. I was like, but we're just sending people free items. That's like, we're losing money here. But yeah. in the long run, they're coming back again and again and again and again and again and again. They're telling their friends about you. They're coming back. So, you know, whatever, if, if there's, if that sample doesn't work, I'll send you something different. Interesting. That that's very cool. I would assume because you're kind of sending out like a little sample pack, right. Of maybe some treats and whatnot. Then people, they're like, "Hey, my dog really loved this one, so I actually want. Let's go. Let's go find the full version, right? We need the the full package of that. So, do you see? That's the idea. And are you are you able to track that at all to see like what that, you know, take rate is, so to speak, that people upgrade 
you know, at all? Yeah, we, I don't do a good enough job using attribution, the Amazon attribution link. That's, that's something um, I probably need to pay a little bit more attention to, to like track where that sale is coming from, especially when I send out emails and, and use social media to promote items. I probably need to do that better, but there, I'm assuming, you know, if um, it's all assumption, but if I send them a smaller version of an item and uh, we later launch that item, uh, I'm assuming that customer is one is going to want to take advantage of that because they like the free sample they got earlier. So uh, I don't have anything set up yet for tracking, but that is something where, you know, when we do send an email, use an attribution link, even the referral bonus so that I get 10% back when yep. they you know, use that link. That's something I got to do. This was so many moving parts to that, that it, uh, I'm sure there is, but if there was a software out there where I could just be like, copy this link, paste in this email and be done with it. That'd be great. <laughs> but, yeah. But yeah. there's just so many moving parts. <laughs> yeah. No, very true. But I guess long story short, you're sending out samples there. They cost you maybe three or four, five bucks. Plus you're paying shipping on that, but you're making an ROI. Um, you know, I guess you don't have the conclusive data on that, but I, I think you keep doing it because you believe you're getting an ROI from that then. Correct. Yeah, and a lot of the items that, that I'm going to be selling are subscribe and save. So mm. I kind of look at that, like, are my subscriptions going up? And I, it's hard to correlate that to the to the sample. But, uh, you know, if my subscri- subscribe and save numbers are going up, uh, I'm getting more customers. People are telling about the brand. They're buying more. They're seeing more raw items. So um, that's something I switched when I first started on Amazon. I, I did just, just like one purchase items. Like they just bought one time. That was it. Yeah. My first item was a, like a dog shot collar and dog training collars, electric collars. Yep. Um, and some people just bought like one time and I would never hear from them again. And so I got out of that space for m- more reasons than we could discuss. Yeah, but, sure. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, subscribe and save is what I'm looking at. So, um, if those numbers go up, I have a feeling that the sample and the, and, and, and all that's paying off. Yeah, no, I, I love that. That's so important. I think that anybody that has replenishable or consumable products, like, Oh my goodness, like this is a great strategy to utilize. Like I would definitely be leveraging free samples of some of your other products, giving people a little taste of it and then watch those subscriptions. Right. That's kind of what you want to be tracking yep. there. So yep. gr- great value shared there. Now, my my question there, too, when you follow up with your email um, subscribers, are you trying to spread that out over a period of, you know, a couple weeks so that you don't just get all the sales in one day on Amazon, right? That you're kind of like boosting up that sales velocity over a period of time rather than just one day? That's a great question. We don't have it separated out. I don't have it separated out by segments. It's just a all blitz go okay. all systems go kind of deal. Um, I have toyed with the idea of doing a separate variation just for that list and then mm. launching a second variation after reviews show up on the listing again to that list. Uh, if you follow what I'm saying there, it's, it's basically give your list one variation of a product blast it out there. Um, and, and in return, they're kind of conditioned to leave reviews. Yep. Uh, and then the second variation with, with my items being local here in the States, it's pretty simple as to switch to a new UPC code and add yep. a new variation within the same listing. It's the same item. Maybe just change from a six count to a seven count or six count to five count or mm-hmm. you know, size, different change, whatever. It's the same item. But then now, when I launch the true item that I want to go after and that I'm really wanting to scale up, I can then hit up that list again, turn on PPC, hit up the influencers. And now I've got reviews and my conversion rate is a lot higher than it would be if I didn't have those initial reviews at the very beginning. So yeah, uh, makes sense. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, you know, area to teeter on, but it's been working. I love, I love that. Uh, I think that's a, that's a wicked smart strategy. I think people can <laughs> implement as well. There's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with variations. And the nice thing is r- right now, Amazon just merges all the variations, even if that old variation where some of those reviews came from drops off. Um, yep. so 
I think it's it's a fantastic way to get some reviews and get some traction early. So let's talk about PPC as it relates to launch. Do you believe that PPC is a big component of somebody's launch strategy or should it be, you know, like you push it to later? Because I think we've heard different opinions. Some people say, no, wait till you get five reviews, right? Some magical number, right? Um, until you turn on PPC. Some people, and I'm in this camp, we launch PPC campaigns day one. Um, and if that's the case, tell us about like the structure that you use with PPC campaigns when you're launching a new product. I'm with you, Josh, on day one. Day one, launch PPC, get that data going, get the clicks coming, get the added carts going, uh, get people to you know click around your, your listing. So day one, PPC go live. I like to do exact match. Uh, and if you do really good keyword research, and if you're brand, brand registered and you got brand analytics, you can really find the terms you want to go after. I like to do exact match, uh, and I'll, I'll play with broad and phrase. Uh, as I want to spread out and find new keywords to go after. Uh, but at the very beginning, I want Amazon to know, hey, look, these five or 10 keywords that I've got in this exact match campaign, my products are relevant for it. And and I want to show up for it. And so I'll go, you know, heavy exact top of search multiplier turned on. Give me that up, down bid strategy as well. And, you know, okay. this is outside of Solozo. Like I'm like, this would be launch strategy only, uh, you know, up, down strategy. <laughs> aggressive top of search multiplier, five or 10 keywords, uh, budget. I keep the budget kind of tight, maybe like 50 bucks or so. Okay. Um, and then something I like to do is day part that campaign, meaning that that campaign won't turn on until like, let's just call it noon central time. The yep. uh, reason for that is as, as we see inside the data and as we look at, you know, PPC cost per clicks uh, throughout the day, you know, the highest cost per click is going to be at that 1201 when the, when the, day starts and everybody's bidding. So throughout the day, cost per clicks go down a little bit. Uh, also conversion rate goes up throughout the day. So um, I kind of wait and let all the big players like spend their money and who knows how much m budget they have, but yeah. they can run out of budget. And then I come in around that noon time um, with that aggressive PPC strategy, hopefully to run throughout the rest of the day, uh, get those, get those clicks, add to carts. I think add to cart gets overlooked here. Add to cart is something that will help you rank. So if people, mm. you know, even if they don't even buy it, they just come to your and they buy it at a later date, uh, add to cart. Um, so exact match, add to cart, uh, or use exact match to get add, add to carts, uh, for your PPC campaigns. And then, um, if you do have reviews, um, I like video ads. If you don't have reviews yet, um, I'm kind of wishy-washy on that. I still need to test it out on my own products. But, um, you know, if you have reviews, I would definitely do video ads and sponsor brand video ads. Do go after the same keywords. The uh, reason I say that is just uh, I feel like the, the video won't perform as well uh, if you don't have reviews. Hmm. Uh, you can't just looks maybe it looks weird. Maybe that's my own opinion, but I um, probably need to look at that a little bit more. But uh, wait wait for some reviews if you, if you can to get the sponsor brand video ad up and running just to kind of save some cost on the, on the advertising budget that you're going to need to launch products. So, you know, if you don't have reviews, go all in on the sponsor product, get that product rank, get that you know organic rank up um, and then transition over to some videos. And then you could try to do a sponsor display and product targeting on your competitors. Um, all this stuff's like, you know, 60, 90 day, Time frame, but I like to run personally, like just to get enough data in here and, and get enough um, like clicks and yeah. impressions and how to carts and all that kind of stuff. And then I can dial it back a little bit. 90 is probably too long. I'll, I'll probably go more to 60. Uh, I'm kind of impatient on that. I want to make sure <laughs> I'm not bleeding too much money. Right. Yeah. So I'll do 60 day and then uh, cut out some of the losses, do some more keyword research, um, do some broad phrase, all that good stuff. But it's, it's constant learning, right? Like, Oh yeah. It just keep going. But another cool thing I like to do is um, on the listing itself, like make the price. So set your price, right. And you could do your, you could do your launch. And then uh, depending on how aggressive you want to be, you know, 30 days after you do that launch, you can lower your price. And now you get this little slash through on the listing. that says like lowest price in 30 days type of red badge on so when people are scrolling through mobile, it kind of draws their attention to your listing because now you've got like this little red uh, badge on the listing that says like lowest price in 30 days. And then I also like to add 
the the neon green coupon, uh, especially for items that like I'm in subscribe and save. Uh, that just draws more people's attention to it. Some of your competitors may not use it, but just at the beginning, I'm trying to get clicks, impressions. Uh, I'm taking a loss on PPC. I, you just, I'm just, I'm, I guess I'm conditioned to that now. And then uh, as we rank and as we get uh, reviews, uh, we start to be a little bit more profitable and, and, and dial back our PPC a little bit. Interesting. Okay, so you're willing to be aggressive up front. What type of ACOS should people expect when they are launching? This is always a good one. I get this all the time, especially uh-huh. with doing calls with sellers. Like, what should my ACOS be? I'm like, look, I see ACOS from like 200% to 300% at the very beginning, especially when they okay. launch products. And this is in the supplement niche. So a lot of the sellers I'm working with are you know, in really competitive niches. Uh, and, and I'm doing it myself. I'm going really high ACOS. And I say this just because you're um, just because you tell a tool or you tell you're willing to go to a 200% ACOS doesn't mean that the tool that you're using is going to get there. It just means that your ceiling of like uh strategy or your ceiling of risk is higher. Um, it doesn't mean that you're actually going to have a 2%, 200% ACOS. Uh, whereas if you set your ACOS too low, let's say 50% or 30%, yeah. You've kind of capped out how high your bid can be, and you yep. may be losing impressions, and you may be losing clicks. Where if you have a little bit higher uh, a cost target that you can swallow at the very beginning, you could have got some more sales and maybe a little bit more reviews. So I, I'm really aggressive on PPC. PPC. Um, it may not be for everybody for that, but you know I'm trying to get data. I'm trying to get ranked on page one. I'm letting Amazon know that these are the keywords I want to go after. And then if those keywords don't work for me in the future, you know, we'll maybe do some more long tail stuff, but at least I'm ranked for it or at least I got ranked for it and and get some sales organically. Awesome. Awesome. Makes a lot of sense with your exact match keywords. Are you putting them into just one campaign or do you try to set up, you know, single keyword campaigns, exact match. So you have more control over that top of search, right? Because I top of search, you can't control at a keyword level. You can only do it at a campaign level, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll actually separate it by search volume. So like my top five are going to be in one campaign together. Uh, I, I have a, this is my opinion. I don't know if it's true or not, but I have a feeling like campaign history and like campaign relevancy and how well that campaign converts has something to do with where you rank at as far as when mm. you bid on keywords. So like having a really good campaign data, like bunched together uh, that are relevant for your keywords I have a feeling that has something to do with where you rank at. It's just my opinion again, but who knows, but I, I'll put them in, I'll break them up in, um, I'll break them up in like search volume tiers. So like, you know, uh, less than 10,000 go here, more than 10,000 okay. go there, more than 20,000 go here. And each one will have their own budget. And then I can set different target a cost goals on each one of them. Um, because I know like, Hey, this one, I want to go really aggressive after, but if I rank for this, really a highly searched term, it's also going to benefit on this long tail one as well. So I don't really need to be that aggressive on these long tail ones because these, these higher ones are going to help and, and vice versa as well. Like yeah. I can be really aggressive on a long tail one and, and maybe the, the one that gets searched the most, I just, I can't become profitable on It's just not going to work. So I'll go really heavy on a long tail one. No, know, knowing that it's going to help the higher one as well, rank yeah. organically as well. So, uh, this is why you got to look at the data. You got you got to look at the data. Yep. You got to see what's what's going on. It's just not a set and forget it. Yep, man. I I think we could spend a whole nother hour just talking about <laughs> different ways to set up your campaigns for launches. You know, for us, what we do is we do break it into single keyword campaigns, and we only activate it on what we term we break our keywords into into four different kind of buckets of keywords. You have your shop keywords, typically your longer tail keywords but sometimes they're super high volume keywords that when you search for that product, like it is only your competitors that show up for that listing, right? You're not seeing like, you know, lunch boxes and, you know, then a a water bottle, like a bunch of hodgepodge, so to speak. You want to make sure that those keywords are like hyper relevant to like your product, right? That's what we turn on first. And it's, it's only those. And then we also will turn on product targeting because I think to your point there, Amazon likes the add to carts. And what I think is if you can put in some of the top sellers 
that are already generating traffic. And if you can do product targeting on their pages specifically, and if you steal a sale from them, I think Amazon boosts kind of your ranking juice, so to speak. It's like, oh, they came to this guy who was the number one seller, and then they ended up converting on this new product. Hmm, maybe I should give this new product a little bit more love. So we go very aggressively to begin with, like product targeting our top competitors, saying, "Hey, we're we're all in. We want to we want to steal sales from these guys." Have you seen that uh, working at all in terms of product targeting? Yeah, and and sometimes it it helps to have some reviews, obviously, for that product targeting for that conversion rate to be a little bit better. Uh, but I like to test it out separately, uh, just like you mentioned, like do product targeting, see how it performs. Especially if you have an item, especially at launch, when your item is priced cheaper than your competitor, mm-hmm. maybe you yep. have that little coupon added to it, so it kind of shows up a little bit. Um, you know, you could you could potentially. And I love doing this, especially in the niche I'm in. Is like you know, you may have somebody who's always bought brand X and you just keep targeting brand X. And if it takes $20 or whatever your, you know, uh, customer acquisition cost is, uh, I like to, I like to watch shark tank. And that's always one of the questions they ask is like, what's your customer acquisition cost? So I I like to figure that out. Like, so if you know your customer acquisition cost, you could probably spend 30, $40 um, to get that customer. And now they're a subscriber. I was in this kind of a tangent, but I was looking at my, uh, there's a tool out there uh, that shows you like customer repeat purchases. Like the and, lifetime value. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a guy that is bought from us for like four or five years straight. Never, n- never talked to him or never like have any idea. N- never knew about it. It's it just like, how did I get that customer is what I keep asking myself. How'd that yeah. guy how did that guy find me? Like, why did he find this product? And he's been buying it for four years. He's never said anything. He's never sent an email. He's never complained about anything. I don't even know if he's left a review. So I went in and just sent him a new order. Like, and this is when they had uh, shipping history and there's a uh-huh. way to find shipping history and just shipped them a whole bunch of product. And I don't know what happened, but like, that kind of stuff is fun. It's like, if you can, if you know what you're willing to spend to get a new customer, you may have that customer for four or five years or life. Who knows? Yeah. Yep. So being able to understand what your lifetime value is for your customers, then you can backtrack and say, okay, my lifetime value of a customer is a hundred bucks. Well, okay. And, and what profit, right? What's your margin on that? Then you can say, all right, well, you can spend up to, you know, that's what your customer acquisition cost should end up being, yep. right? So it might yep. not be profitable on the front end, but you know you're going to make those sales on the back end, especially if you have subscription products. So completely agree with you there. What is the do you do you know the name of the tool that that helps you figure out the lifetime value or like repeat purchases and like tie it to previous yeah. orders? It's a newer tool that I've been playing around. Nozzle. Uh, Nozzle. Yeah, Nozzle. I haven't heard of that one. Um, I think it's nozzle.ai. Um, you can go in there and you can see, they'll show you like what your true, uh, tacos, like your true target a cost should be. Uh, it's really good for, uh, like find out your customer lifetime value, knowing what your a cost needs to be for sellers. I, I, I do like it. Uh, it's got a lot of information in here that I haven't seen any other tool have. That's amazing. I love it. Nozzle.ai. Yep. Is it, uh, how do you spell that? N O Z Z L E dot AI. Um, okay. um, they got a trial. I'm not even affiliated with them. I just found it and used it. So cool. uh, n- nothing here, but uh, definitely would you know do a demo with them. It's pretty cool. Awesome. I love that. Thanks for sh- sharing a new tool. I- I'm excited. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to go check that one out <laughs> myself. Um, You know, Chris, you also mentioned briefly with your launch strategy that like maybe there's some influencers involved. Um, Is that something you actively do? Have you seen success with that? Um, You know, what are some ins and outs about influencer marketing that people should be aware of? Yeah, I think it's something that people are going to need to have like in their tool tool bucket or the tool chest moving forward. Um, No no matter what, I think everybody's going to be somebody thinks they're an influencer. There's social media everywhere. TikTok, 
you know, was working like crazy. Uh, Instagram reels, like I think you just got to be there. Uh, so we do have an influencer uh, type of setup. Uh, we just <laughs> we just Googled like pet niche influencer like company and we found really? a, a website. Yeah. Like that we found a website that uh, it like organizes all this and, and you basically apply to be a brand on this website. And then these influencers, uh, uh, you know, apply to get your product and you either pay them, you know, 20 bucks, 50 bucks, or they just send them a free item. And in return, all you, all that we ever ask is just tag us uh, so that we know that you tagged us and we can just share it to our audience. Uh, but but the main reason we're doing it is obviously like to get the user generated content. Like, so, so like on our images, like we mentioned earlier, the, yeah. this episode, like having a proof of concept and like, Oh, these people buy it. So what we've done um, is when we get a lot of influencers that, you know, buy our product or they post it about it, we ask them if we could get those images, like the raw file of it. And then uh, I, I really like Canva. I've played with Canva for years, but I feel like I'm getting better at it. Uh, so I'll just take those images. I'll put it into Canva, make some type of like photo collage and, and name it like trusted by trusted by hundreds of dogs or thousands of dogs. That's and, cool. And I'll make that like my last image before the video shows up uh, just to kind of like go through that storytelling of like, here's the item. Here's what it does. Here's the benefits of it. Oh yeah. Here's proof of concept. Like here's why people love it. And then here's our video talking about our brand. So um we do that just for the content. And then we do give a code out um, like here, share this code okay. so people can buy it. And here's a code you can use. Um, and we kind of just track that through that code. Uh, something again, like I mentioned earlier is I don't use attribution enough. I would love to, if there's a tool out there where everybody, like every influencer gets on our own attribution link, uh, put my referral link in there. And then now I can just, without manually having to do all this setup, cause it, it seems kind of a, uh, a lot of work at the very beginning to like manually do all these links, put your attribution link in there and then send them all out. If, if an influencer could just apply, they get their link and I put my yep. referral bonus in it. And then that's the link they use. Then we could be able to track like where that's coming from. Um, so that's what we're, we're playing around with, but yeah, influencer, I think it's just something you're going to need to do. Um, if your product has a good vibe to it, I don't know if you, uh, if you've ever seen the video, but there was, maybe a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago, there was this like this gel bead uh, uh -huh. water gun type tool, at, like gel beads that shoots these little like beads that are full of water in this little like gun and gel blaster, I think is what it was called. But that thing went crazy. Like on TikTok, people start seeing these kids having fun with these guns shooting around and, and it took off on, on, uh, on Amazon. So I think this, if you have a product that has a good story behind it and is shareable and has good content, um, you got to have some type of influencer backing and social media strategy. Yeah. So are you paying, are you paying for like Instagram posts or whatever? Like how are you compensating these influencers and what have you found to be the most successful? I try first to say free item, like okay. we'll give you a free item. Normally that's good. Normally that's like perfect. No problem. Here's my shipping address. Okay. And I'll send it to them and I'll give them a coupon code when they get there. Normally that's fine. And so far it's been working really well just on that. But I do get some people like I'll do it for $20. Or I'll do it for $50. I've had some outrageous ones like you know, 1800, two grand. Uh, I just, I feel like there's a lot of other smaller fish I can go play with okay. and don't need to worry about the higher ticket ones. I rather have like 200 micro influencers, smaller influencers than just one big massive one. Uh, yeah, that's my my opinion. But um, yeah, some of them are just like free items, good, and that, that works great, and have no pushback. And I do get some that say uh, we'll do it plus twenty dollars or plus fifty dollars. And normally I'm just like that's fine, we'll just do it. Okay, uh, I don't I don't mind paying you know fifty bucks or a hundred dollars just to get the content. Interesting. Interesting. But you've seen, I know you give them some coupon codes, right? Um, so you have seen sales then come from the influencer marketing, I would assume. And that's why you're, you, you continue to go that route. Is that correct? Yeah. And I'm, I'm experimenting now on a product that I'm not using PPC on. So I'm not using PPC on this item just to see how much traction I can get from social media. 
and and no paid ads. Uh, I mean, I guess social media is paid ad, but but no Amazon paid ads. I'm not doing any ads on Amazon with this product. I'm just doing social media blast. And I get a few, like three, four, five sales a day uh, through it. The link I give them though is the if you go to mobile and uh, if you look at your product to the mm. right, yeah, to the yep. right of your image is that that little share yep. uh, link. I, I I get that link and I share that to the influencer and say just share this link. Um, I don't know if that has any help, but I'm going to try that link to see if that has any any, any boost. I love that. Uh, I, I've heard of that, that kind of hack, so to speak, that I think Amazon does like that, like sharing feature, right? Um, so adds that social virality. Well, I figured it was the it. closest, like white hat thing. Like the link's in there. It's coming from yeah. Amazon. Yep. You, you put it there. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to use it. Yeah. Yeah. You're not doing anything shady. Yeah. I'm a big believer in like, yeah. go white hat, you know, all the way. Um, so I, I love that, that strategy. Uh, love it. Well, well said. Um, I think that's that's a lot of value. You've shared a lot of value, Chris. I think I could keep asking you question after question here. And uh, you, you have so much experience and you've seen not only in your own brands, but with other people that you're looking under the hood of their businesses as you consult for them. So thank you for all the actionable strategies that you've shared today. Um, I do have some final questions that I want to ask you. But before we get to those, I love to leave the audience with three actionable takeaways from each episode. Here are the three takeaways that I noted, Chris. Let me know if you think I've, I'm missing something. So to begin with, we started our conversation with listing images. So my actionable item for everybody should be to go take a look at your listing images. And if you are not having a professional whether it be a graphic designer working on them or a professional photographer working on them or doing 3D renderings, like that's honestly where you should probably start your focus. Um, and then we kind of layered onto that, like focusing on that main image. How do you make your main image stand out compared to everything else that you see? So when you scroll on mobile, if you see everything's kind of looking the same, you've got to start cr- coming up with creative ways to maybe push the envelope a little, you know, um, add a few extra features to your product to make it stand out, right? Zooming in on a product or zooming out, adding, you know, if, if it comes with multiple items, like adding more items or taking away a few items um, so that you just want people to click in to that listing. That's, that's action item. Number one action item. Number two, I would say is you've got to start building that audience, right? And so if you are not figuring out a way or have a strategy to obtain people's email addresses, their phone numbers so that you can text them, I'm a big fan of text message marketing. The, the opt-in rates are good and the, you know, the click-through rates are even better than what you see in email because everybody knows their email inbox is just completely full. So figuring out a strategy um, of how you're going to attract people there uh, would be another item. And I think kind of a bonus add- add-on to that would be if you have subscription-related products, consider sending out sample packages of those other products that you have in the hopes that those people are going to return. They're going to upgrade to the actual you know, product itself, and then they're going to become a subscribe and save um, you know, customer of yours. So I think that's a fantastic like free gift to be giving people. And it's just a ton of value. Like uh, who's going to complain about receiving a, uh, extra freebies in the mail. And then last but not least, when it comes to launching um, new products on Amazon, uh, I think there's three strategies that you can quickly implement um, is number one, reaching out to an audience. Number two, activating PPC from day one. And then action item number three would be incorporating some influencer marketing. And on that note, I think you mentioned, Chris, you know, whether I wish there's like a software tool that could like give attribution links to all of these um, affiliates or influencers. Um, when I was at the Sell and Scale Summit, I ran into Refersion and I'm actually working to get the CEO um, of Refersion on the podcast. But so far, they are the only ones that are claiming that they can give like kind of these affiliate links using your attribution link 
to influencers. So um, I need to do my due diligence on that a little bit more, but that's a new thing, new software that I've come across that hopefully will. I'm glad you mentioned that because I info. walked by their booth as well. I walked by their booth as well. I was like, Did what you? do you guys do here? Like, what's going on here? And and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, yeah, if they that could be a good tool uh, if, if they could do all that. You know, the referral link and, and bonus and all that good stuff. That'd be nice. Yep. So we'll see. Fingers crossed, right? We'll see. Or maybe it's yeah. maybe it's on the uh the roadmap down the road. Um so Chris, I, I kind of something summed things up there. Uh is there anything you feel like I was missing that you know our listeners should definitely pay attention to? No, I think you hit a lot there. Um a lot of good stuff. I think you got you got it in there. That's pretty good. Impressive. I'm definitely taking mental notes here on how you're running this podcast. <laughs> well, I, I, now I'm, I, I need to do this on the receiving side. I need to join your podcast and be on the opposite yeah. side. So I'll, I'll take my own tips <laughs> away. Um, all right. So Chris, let's dive into kind of the final questions here. Uh, number one, what has been the most influential book that you've read and why? Yeah. I'm, and I put her back here cause I saw this question. It's right here. Uh, Built to Sell is the book I've been that I read mm. most recently that I really got involved with. You know, uh, I I try to read some of these books and it's more like here's what I did and and, and here's what I did here's what I used to do. But this one is like a story, like it's a made up story, uh, and it tells about a guy that has an advertising firm and how his like his mentor told him like don't just be like a big advertising firm, find one spot within the advertising world that you like and be the best at that one. And people mm. will come to you and pay more because you're the expert with postcards or whatever. So that was kind of cool. Like that, that really got me into it. And that kind of shifted my mind. I was like, don't just be a generic Amazon seller, go be the best like dog treat company you can be and be the best yeah. at it and be all in on it. So, um, built the sell, uh, definitely, definitely a good book, quick read, uh, something I would definitely recommend. Awesome. Love that. I'm going to have to go check that one out. I like, I like that advice there. All right. Next question here. What is your favorite productivity tool or resource? So I think this one uh, is pretty generic. I like Google docs, Google docs. I use uh, for most everything, uh, sharing stuff with uh, VA, sharing stuff with uh, potential like investor, whatever it is. But like Google Docs is just an easier way to store data. I recently had, so the reason I'm in love with Google Docs now is because I had a bad experience with not using Google Docs. Mm. My laptop, I lost all, all of it because nothing was, nothing was shared. Nothing was shared in my Google Doc drive. I lost all of it. So I rebuilt it on my computer. So I had to, had to redo it all. So now I'm like, okay, we're using Google Docs moving forward. Everything is in here. Spreadsheets are in here. Photos are in here. That way, if somebody's computer busts and dies, yeah. you don't lose that data anymore. So I think Google Docs is one that gets overlooked. Backing everything up to the cloud. I, I All like of that. It. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Because, uh, you know, we have like a lot of design files and it's the same thing for us. It's like we've got to have multiple backups. I cannot imagine what would happen if that just disappears one day. Right. Yeah. It so, sucks. Believe me. <laughs> yeah. All right. Last question here. Who is someone that you admire the most in the e-commerce space and that other sellers should be paying attention to? This is a tough one. I saw that question. I was like, this is tough because I am constantly like learning from other sellers and like other people in the space. Uh, I like to watch a lot of YouTube videos. Um, one that is coming to the top of my mind right now is uh, his heist on YouTube. Uh, hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, his, he goes by Adam Heist on YouTube. He doesn't even know I follow him, which is great because, like, he <laughs> doesn't even know if it's kind of funny, right? Like, and then there's a couple on on uh, Instagram that I like to follow. The guy uh, that handled the Genius Company. Um, he created uh, a lot of good supplements that are in the in the supplement space. Big, big dollar. Uh, but yeah. he's he's like 30 years old, 20 million, 20 million in, in earnings. I like to follow him. There's like not a set one because they all bring different things to the table. You know, like uh, Adam over at Heist on YouTube, he brings like really good strategy and really good like things to do with keyword research. And then uh, this newer guy I'm following on Instagram, he's he's more like mental, like get your mind right. And and, and probably, so there's this hard, like I don't really have like a, a set mentor. I would just say find somebody you like and just stick with them and, and follow their path. 
There's a lot of other fake mentors out there. And, and a lot of them are teaching because they couldn't sell. And so yeah. Uh, yeah. be careful what you watch out there. Yeah, totally agree. Well, I think you've, you've dropped a lot of knowledge today, Chris, and I appreciate your time. And uh, if people want to follow up with you, they want to learn more. Maybe they're interested in Solozo. Tell us where they can find you. I think you also have like a free gift you wanted to offer our audience and tell yeah. us, tell us where to go. Yeah. So, uh, slozo.com S E L L O Z O.com. Uh, there's a button on there that says like request a demo. It doesn't have to be a demo. It can just be a call and we can just chat about whatever. Um, as you can tell, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this space. So that's easy spot to get me. If you want to talk to me personally, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Chris Gramlich, K R I S G R A M L I C H. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You can always send me a private message. Um, happy to help. I love talking shop. So if you need, if you have questions, I'd love to help out. Awesome. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we'll, we'll hope to chat again and, and see even more strategies as the years evolve and, and move on. So thanks for joining us. Josh, thank you. You were great. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.